Hi everybody! During the months of March and April, we are highlighting the work of Rios to Rivers in our community effort to showcase organizations who are working towards social justice, environmental action, and more inclusive public lands. Rios to Rivers inspires the protection of rivers worldwide by investing in underserved and indigenous youth who are intimately connected to their local waters and support them in their development as the next generation of environmental stewards. Founded in 2012, Rios to Rivers programs have connected 234 underserved and indigenous students from 20 endangered river basins in seven countries. The programs have included students and community leaders from 21 indigenous nations. Rios to Rivers envisions a world in which youth who are intimately connected to their local waters and tribal communities are equipped to become the next generation of passionate leaders for healthy rivers and communities. Make monthly charitable giving a trend in your life in 2024 and help to support Rios to Rivers this March and April. Visit the link in our Instagram bio for more information. Hello, and welcome to Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks. If you're joining us for the first time, Trail Mix is the short format episodes of our show. While our long format episodes explore one hiking trail in one national park, one park at a time, Trail Mix allows us to dive deeper into things we didn't get to cover in our long format episodes, including history, science, environmental justice, and interviews. And today's Trail Mix features a very special guest, the Chief Programming Officer for the National Park Foundation, Lisa Engenbrug. Lisa oversees the foundation's programmatic strategy for protecting parks, connecting people to the natural and cultural heritage parks preserve, and strengthening the extensive national network of nonprofit partners that support the more than 400 national parks across the country. For more information about the work of the National Park Foundation, be sure to visit their website, nationalparks.org. As someone committed to equity, conservation, and responsible recreation, Lisa has been a powerhouse in outdoor education and philanthropy for over 30 years, a lover of all outdoor spaces, especially grasslands, mountains, and wetlands, Lisa's impressive history as a steward of the outdoors shows her commitment to these spaces and their betterment. We were so fortunate to be able to sit down with Lisa and discuss the work of the National Park Foundation and the national parks as windows into the natural world, as classrooms and spaces for all. Please join us in welcoming Lisa to the show. We are so grateful to have Lisa Engenbrug on the show today, who is the Chief Programming Officer of the National Park Foundation. We had the pleasure of being connected with you through some lovely channels, and we're so excited to be able to sit with you and and talk to you about the National Park Foundation, your history with conservation, and just your history within the outdoors. So thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely, my pleasure. So I think a great question to start with, because some people may not know, but can you, Lisa, tell us what the National Park Foundation is? So the National Park Foundation is a congressionally chartered foundation that was set up in 1967 specifically to support the national parks by bringing private philanthropy to help the parks do the things they can't cover entirely with their federal dollars. And how has that impact felt or in what ways would you say that impact kind of is impressed most upon the parks? So it's a it's a really interesting story because for the first 20 years, the National Park Foundation wasn't raising a lot of money. I don't think people knew who we were. At the time of the Park Centennial, which was 2016, there was a real acknowledgement by the board and the director of the Park Service that we really needed to up our game, that the needs in the parks, everything from getting underserved kids outside to funding very complex wildlife habitat restorations, needed additional funding. And so there was a big effort through a campaign called Find Your Park. Uh, it was a marketing campaign, really at that time targeted at millennials, but the idea was to capture a younger audience and get people to know who is the National Park Foundation, why do national parks need help? And the difference is huge. In 2016, I would say we were raising about $30 million per year to put into the national parks, and now it is close to $180 million, and we hope this year to be at $200 million. So big, big change, 
much bigger impact on the parks, much closer relationship with the National Park Service, just much more focused campaigns across the board through lots of different channels to get people to know about why do national parks need philanthropic help. That's incredible. To be less than 10 years and to have increased by 150 million is wonderful considering how much the parks do need it's because they can't do it alone. There was a real sense that people love parks and it's this incredibly democratic idea that we're really blessed to have in the United States, that it's it's a space for everyone, a place for everyone, protects such important resources, but people didn't know uh, about us and didn't know what the needs were. And so I think it's a real reflection of how much people love national parks. And we've seen from knowing and looking at numbers, the numbers explode in the parks. So it makes a lot of sense too, with that giant leap in numbers, even from just 2016, from the centennial, onward with that little bit of a dip with COVID, only a little bit of a dip. It makes a lot of sense that you're seeing more people in the parks because I think COVID allowed more people to kind of realize, oh, there are these great things that I can do. I can be outside. I don't have to be around people or I can be around but distance. Um, that's just continued on. And you had those people that always loved the parks that were there. So it's wonderful to see that correlation between the rise in interest and visitorship and it seems like the rise in funding that's coming through NPF. Yeah, and I, I think the way to think about it is, I think you're exactly right. You know, we saw a little bit of a dip for national parks during COVID, but parks in general, if you think about local parks, trails, everyone rediscovered parks during COVID. And I think what it did was reconnected people to experiences that they may have had as children, but maybe weren't doing anymore. The other thing is, is there's this increasing body of academic research that indicates that parks are good for your physical health, good for your mental health, are places where people who have not felt welcome before can experience the outdoors and reconnect with others. So it's also a place of community. And I think people really found that during COVID and we saw numbers go up even more last year. So the recent, uh, the Park Service just put out its new visitorship numbers last week up to, I think, 325 million, which is a 14 million person increase over the prior year. So there's something for everybody in the parks. And I think people really have come to appreciate that. And I think we're just going to continue to see this growth year over year. I would imagine that Great Smoky Mountains is still number one, the number one visited park. I think it is still true. Although the superintendents josh each other about, you know, who has the most visitorship. And there are some parkways that are also considered part of the national park system. And I think Blue Ridge Parkway gets more visitorship, but that's different than going into a national park like Great Smoky Mountains. That is true. I think we un- I think we uncovered that in um, an episode. We were like, but technically the one that might have more is yeah, Blue Ridge Parkway. I'm curious to know the work that you do with the National Park Foundation. What does that make your day to day look like? So it's a little bit of everything. I'd say my main responsibility is to have a relationship with the Park Service so that we really understand what their needs and priorities are. The second part of that was really building out our programmatic staff, adding some very experienced people, but also having the opportunity to mentor people new to this field. Um, you know, I'd say about a third of our staff, this is their first or second job. So it's really important to me at this stage in my career that I am mentoring and uplifting and providing opportunities to new people that want to get into this field that might not have known about it. So it's everything from staff management to lots of meetings. I don't get out in the parks as much as I'd like as part of my job. I will say I get out in the parks a lot as part of my uh, passion outside of work. And then sometimes am able to go to national parks as part of the job. I have a lot of curiosity too, just about your kind of role, but what you also see as a role for the parks. So A question that I have is, how do you see the roles of the parks, um, be it a small historical park or a large national park, as an educational force? And what sort of educational roles do you think parks can fill? So it's really interesting. You know, the first national parks were initially set up to 
protect large landscapes from potential development. That was the idea behind them, whether it was to protect wildlife habitat, wildlife canyons, the natural features. And then there was this real recognition that there were also cultural resources. And so if you think about the mission of the Park Service, it is to protect our most important natural and cultural resources. And the second part of its mission, which we also support, is to connect people to those resources. And so the Park Service itself has this really important mission, which sometimes can be at odds with each other. Um, You know, you want to connect people. We don't want to connect them too closely to a grizzly bear or, or a bison or the edge of a canyon or a geyser. But you want them to know about them. And you know, I mentioned at the beginning that's really this was this incredible democratic idea. The whole idea of public lands, there are other public lands in the world, but the size and scale of the national park system in the United States, there's nothing else like it. And the types and depth and breadth of resources that it protects. And so it really is this opportunity. There's one in every state and every territory. So there's something within driving distance. They really, to me, represent America's classroom. They are places where teachers can go with their students, or you can go on your own as a family, or you can go as an individual and experience how we became a nation at Independence Hall, or experience the birth home of Martin Luther King, or experience seeing geysers and these wonders of the world in Yellowstone or Grand Canyon. And so whether it is science, history, culture, or anything else that is within the parks, it really is this amazing classroom. And so one of the things we're also looking at with the Park Service is we want everybody to visit parks, but we don't want everybody to come all at once to the same park. So how do we spread the joy, fun, awe, and wonder of parks? Are there opportunities to increase and harness digital technologies that would allow people to have a better experience in a park, number one, possibly get some educational resources while you're in the park, or how do you give that kid in Los Angeles that may never get to Everglades, Big Cypress, or Cape Cod? National Seashore or or to the civil rights sites like the, the bridge at Selma. How do you bring that to classrooms? How do you bring that to parks that are more local so that you can learn about lots of parks at a park? And we hope that would then ignite people's desire to see all of the parks. But I think we know it's not, it's not realistic that every American is going to be able to visit 425 national park system sites. So you just mentioned about how these spaces serve as like America's classroom. Something that uh, the National Park Service has always said of itself is that it's America's storyteller or that it, it preserves the storytelling of America. And something that I feel like, at least in the last four years, has come out quite a bit is just all of the possibility of intersection that exists with every one of these park spaces, be it a national historic park, a landmark, a giant national park. So I'm curious about like, what are some projects and some programs that the National Park Foundation has in in place or is doing right now that sort of like are examples of like those intersections starting to happen? We're doing so much in this regard because if you think about the Park Service, you think that a lot of it was created at the turn of the century and even added to over the years and the heyday of investment was really um, in the 60s. A lot has changed and a lot of views about what are the stories that are important to tell and how can you tell a more comprehensive or inclusive set of stories at parks. It was really a priority for the Secretary of Interior and for the Director of the Park Service that we all take a look at more inclusive storytelling. We've been investing in it for years, but about two years ago, we were really hearing from a lot of parks that this was a real need and there was no funding for it. So the first time we offered this was two years ago, and we said, well, we we could provide up to $2 million in funding. We were really surprised to find out that we had $9 million in requests quests and that 90% of them were at a stage where they could be funded. So we went back to our board and came up with another 2 million. So we're able to fund 4 million and we're about to offer it again. And the kind of stories that we're looking at and we hear from the parks are things like at Hot Springs National Park, which is in um, Arkansas and it's built around these um, hot springs. And it was touted as America's first resort. It opened in 1832. 
But the African-American community that worked there and made the park run, their story was not told. So now with a grant from the National Park Foundation, that story is being researched, community engaged, and the story told. Another one is Mina Edison, Thomas Edison's wife. Um, A lot of stories about women are not often told either. She was really philanthropic for orphanages and victims of domestic abuse, and she was committed to desegregation and a real advocate for women women. And so now the Thomas Edison home is going to have a featured story of Mina Edison. And this is true for almost every community that you can think of that you wouldn't think has a story in a park, whether it's the Chinese laundry at Yosemite or many Native American stories. A lot of national parks are on the ancestral homes of Native Americans, and it's only been in recent years that there's been real attention to how do you collect those stories and how do you uh, have the voice of the communities brought into the parks. Does National Parks Foundation, how do they engage with indigenous groups? And is there any move there to kind of work towards kind of co-management and conservation of those spaces? Is that something that's kind of enmeshed or starting to become a little bit more prevalent um, through the work that you're doing? Yes. So we're really fortunate right now to have a Secretary of Interior who is Native American as well as the Director of the Park Service. So you can imagine this is a real priority for them and for our board. What we have focused on there initially is providing all the training for the Park Service on co-stewardship and co-management across the system and then investing in sites across the system like adding the Desert View Visitor Center and Cultural Experience Center at Grand Grand Canyon. I think what's different now for the Park Service is the superintendent of Grand Canyon was very careful to and very interested and passionate about engaging the tribal nations for which that's the ancestral home to ask them what did they want? What did they want to see in the site? What would be a good use of the site? And so the site was redesigned. It now has interpretation that was developed collaboratively with Native Americans and then um, is a real opportunity for different tribal nations to come provide experiences within the Desert View Center on their practices, um, particularly arts. So whether it is basket weaving or uh, pottery, whatever they would choose to do. A similar program and site is being established in Yellowstone. I think the way to think about it is there's co-stewardship and co-management. What does that actually mean? And I think it's, there's no one size fits all. It's going to look a little bit different for each park. Um, some have many tribal tribal nations that consider it their ancestral home who may not agree on what should happen. In other cases, there's just a handful of tribal nations, um, and it's pretty easy to come up with agreement on, on what should happen. But there's been a real change, I think, at the Park Service in deep recognition that this is a crucial part of the job in managing parks and is a voice that's very important to the management of the parks. The other place where we're seeing it is in what's called traditional ecological knowledge. So there's a real acknowledgement and seeking out of tribal nations with a different approach to ecological management of some parks. And the two examples that I think of are um, with the condor in Redwoods. Um, That has been a terrific collaboration and, and real change and success story in in how that species is being managed and its recovery. And then the same is true, we're looking at parks in in Maine. Katahdin Woods and Waters is one of our newer uh, parks in, in Maine. And the whole design of the visitor center was done with respect to what did tribal nations want to see and also looking at sweetgrass, the management of sweetgrass from an ecological standpoint, and then also how important it is culturally to the Native American community there. It's a change that's happening. There are some success stories. Do we have more to go, further to go? Absolutely. Kind of jumping off of that, which is what do you feel is kind of the biggest threat to progress in the fight for equity in the outdoors. So this is a really interesting one for me. I've been in this field for 30 years, and I started out as a working wildlife biologist in Kenya and worked very closely with the community there. But this was just not really on my radar screen. I was worried about wildlife 
then morphed to, well, if you care about wildlife, you care about people. They're not, you can't separate them. Worked for a foundation in Colorado. Had met somebody from the Mile High Youth Corps early, early in my career, um, probably in the mid 90s, who was from a youth corps. And I had a conversation with him and he said, you know, I've never been camping. I've never been hiking. He had questions for me about squirrels and, you know, were there bears everywhere in Colorado? And I, I just, I'd hear those things off and on, but it didn't really strike me and change how I thought about this and how now as a funder, I was running a, a foundation at that time, how I needed to change how I thought about this and did this work was my my partner was teaching at a high school for kids that had been bullied or escaping gangs. It was, it was a high school of last resort. Um, and he would play chess with them in the afternoon after school. One of them mentioned to him, he said, oh, you know, what does your partner do? And um, he said, oh, you know, she works for Great Outdoors Colorado. You know, what is that? And he said, you know, the thing is, I take three buses to school. I can see the mountains. You can see the mountains from downtown Denver, but I've never been to them. What's that like? And I really had to take a pause and think, you know, we say the outdoors is for everyone, but is it really? And so at that time, um, my assistant was really interested in this issue and um, she's now the director of the foundation, I'm very proud of her. But we, did, we drove around the state and started talking to people in rural communities, in urban communities, from every walk of life to ask, how do you feel about the outdoors? Do you use the trails? Do you use the baseball fields? Do you go on open space? Have you, do you know where Rocky Mountain National Park is? And we heard it everywhere we went, that there were significant communities that had not felt welcome, didn't know, didn't have parents or siblings that brought them outside, which is the way most people first experience the outdoors. And we came back and talked to the board about it at the time. And I just, I got some blank looks like, what? you know, really, is this, this really what you're worried about? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that I know some of you think this is an urban issue, but it's not just urban kids. So if you think about a place like Leadville, Colorado, it's in the mountains. You're surrounded by public lands. And most people that go there, it's a tourist destination, go there to experience the outdoors. Well, it is also the community that serves Vail. The service industry has to live there because you cannot afford to live in Vail. And so you had all these people living in this area and they, they looked at me and they said, you know, I don't know how, I'd be afraid to go into the woods. I don't know how to go into the woods. So we heard that in rural areas and urban areas, we would hear from, you know, LGBTQ or lower income, upper income, it didn't really matter. Uh, just people that had felt that the outdoor culture was pretty specific, Patagonia wearing um, fleece, wearing people that were outdoors all the time and, and they didn't just weren't connected to it. So that's a long way of, of telling them I'm deeply, deeply committed to this. Um, and I do see there's been a lot of change. It took longer than I would have anticipated from 2007 for this to really rise in importance. But my last job before I came back to the National Park Foundation was working for the Outdoor Industry Association. And so the outdoor companies have really become committed to this. I think they see that, you know, it, it, it's either, I don't care how you come to it. You can come to it because it's morally the right thing to do, or you can come to it because economically we're going to be a more diverse country. And uh, if you don't pay attention to this, you're, you're missing out. And so more people have come to this. And so I think what's changed for the National Park Service is a real recognition for these very reasons that their future workforce is going to look different and should look different, that they welcome a lot of people to the parks and they don't have a problem in some parks with lack of interest in coming to the parks, but it might not be welcoming for everybody. And so what the National Park Foundation has been working on with the National Park Service is a program called Park Ventures. And it started a few years ago, and it is grants to any kind of community group that has felt unwelcome or historically excluded, and they can get a grant to experience the parks. And they work really closely with the park service to make sure it's a good experience. We work often with local park partners. We have 400 smaller park friends groups across the U.S., 
Um, and so they'll often be helpful here. And that has really ranged. It's been amazing to me. And the demand, again, just like the inclusive storytelling, off the charts. We will continue to fund it. We hope to expand that program. We're really fortunate that we've had two corporate partners uh, underwrite a lot of that work um, through Nature Valley um, and Subaru. And I think Sun Outdoors is the, is the third one, but um, I hope I haven't left out an important corporate partner. And I think more and more people realize it is inclusivity is what's going to make the future of the park successful. And something that I love that you just talked about is about how inclusivity and access, it's the same conversation. Access simply can be as granular as, do you have transportation to get there? Even that is a barrier to having people or community groups be able to engage with the outdoors. It's something that we see a lot. There's a lot of nonprofit grassroots organizations that are getting young people into the outdoors. And I'm so happy and so excited that the National Park Foundation is also a part of that story. There are so many different ways we can engage once we are there, but just being able to get there is huge. Yeah, the getting there part has been, I I think that was the earliest recognized barrier. And so we've just hit the 2 million child mark with a program called Open Outdoors for Kids. It started out small. The Park Service gave free passes to every fourth grader in America. And we heard pretty quickly, that's terrific. But how are they going to get there? You know, how are teachers going to be trained and, uh, you know, able to handle this? How do we get some seasonals to help the parks welcome all these new kids in? And so really proud of that program. It's called Open Outdoors for Kids. It's open to every fourth greater. And as as I mentioned, we hit the 2 million kid mark, but it's on a very steep trajectory, just like a lot of what we do, because last year, 400,000 of those 2 million were that was the number we hit with Open Outdoors for Kids. It's incredible to hear just the trajectory of what is happening. And it's impressive to, again, know that there is like this other arm that's able to give the support. It provides such a great opportunity for people to have more engagement with, you know, that space, which I think you would probably agree, like, no matter the age, it's so important to engage with the outdoors, whether you're, you know, a fourth grader, or whether you're, you know, 78, yeah, and I think you you know you mentioned seventy eight year olds. Um, so I've been very focused on kids, um, but I think the other reality for this country right now is we you know we can't read the newspaper right now without hearing about the number of people over the age of sixty five, and so we help fund about one point four million volunteers to work in the parks. So there are both paid opportunities and volunteer opportunities for retirees that may come from different backgrounds or careers, but be helpful to the. Park Park Service and potentially be that community member that connects with someone coming to the parks for the first time that hasn't historically felt welcomed. And so there's there's the experienced worker program, which is something that people can get paid jobs coming back to work for the parks or these volunteer activities. And so I I think if we're going to welcome more people to parks and we're going to reach new audiences and we're going to be as welcoming and as inclusive as possible, we also need to think about that older segment. We um, are really fortunate enough to be friends with um, Brad Ryan and Grandma Joy of Grandma Joy's Road Trip. Her story is still so compelling, I find, because she was in her 80s and told her grandson, I've never seen the ocean and I've never seen a mountain. And so Brad, as we've gotten to know him, is a a bit of a maximalist. So he's like, okay, great. Let's go to every national park in the entire NPS. And they did. And they, they just finished it like last year. But that is probably like, a, am sure, a narrative that is across lot of generations, but particularly that generation over 65. I'm sure Joy is not the only one who, you know, that that's her story. I think, you know, if we feel people under the age of 21 have not felt included, you can be sure there were people in previous generations. uh, And there's still an opportunity to connect, whether it's a road trip to every national park, which would be amazing, or just uh, 
having an experience close to home and finding out what is your national park site within your state that you can that you can drive to um, and discover something new because you don't stop discovering after you reach a certain age. Hey everybody, we are actively planning our hiking for this year, and so you know what that means. Our moon travel guides are out and about, we're marking them up, and we're writing in all of our notes. We sincerely love them, and we use moon travel guides all the time. Moon is our favorite travel guidebook publisher because their authors are real people who live in and know the areas they're writing about like the back of their hand. And we can trust them. From hikes to campsites to city sites to restaurants, Moon Travel has you covered. So ready to cross something off your travel bucket list in 2024? Have a lot of great ideas for trips but don't know how to get started or keep your itinerary organized? Wherever your wanderings might take you or inspire you to go, Moon Travel has you covered. Moon Travel is the travel guidebook publisher for ethical travel. Don't spend months trying to craft the perfect getaway when you can do it all with Moon. Whether you're headed out abroad, planning to take on the open road, or want to wander the trails of a national park, make sure to pack a Moon travel guide with you. And through the end of 2024, our listeners can exclusively get 20% off any Moon travel guide when you go to moon.com. Use the code GAZE24 at checkout. That's right. That is Moon. Dot com and use code GAZE24, and that's G-A-Z-E-2-4 for 20% off any Moon Travel Guide in Moon's entire library at moon.com, and that is exclusively for GAZE listeners. My curiosity is what continues to drive your curiosity about the outdoors? You know, I learn something new at every park site and I am a true extrovert and so I love talking to people there's not a time I don't go to a park and talk to people and I'm just it's just forever interesting to me what people know and don't know about parks and I also think connection to the outdoors I'm glad that the academic data is catching up to I think what those of us who have had the good fortune of spending time outdoors you know I didn't grow up an outdoorsy kid until my grandmother sent me to camp because I was bouncing off the walls. And so for me, going to camp gave me a sense of agency, grit, confidence, friendship, and connection that I did not get anywhere else. And so I see that now, whether you're five or 65, the outdoors really is for everyone. It's not just the outdoors. I, I think the other thing that's new for me is learning about all the cultural sites that are protected by the park system. And that in and of itself, whether it's a battlefield or learning of the civil rights sites has been something that has been a huge investment by the National Park Foundation. Um, We have a very generous donor that really wanted to see those protected. And, you know, we've been able to add 13 sites or stand-up sites that hadn't had funding and, and just really make sure that story doesn't get lost. Or adding Stonewall in 2016, or adding the Emmett Till, Mamie Till site in Mississippi recently. We're also looking at some other additions to the system that are smaller, that are for smaller, more local stories of national significance. I don't think I could visit all 425 sites before I died, but I would sure love to and see some of these cultural wonders that I'm just now finding out about. We were really excited, obviously, about Stonewall because of all of the other cultural significant stories that came out of just starting there. We are both total nerds when it comes to things like this, but the queer heritage theme study that the MPS did on queer history, and I mean, I think we've read the whole thing, like forward and backward a few times, because it's been such a resource for us. Also, we're getting a visitor center at Stonewall very soon, which we're really excited about to. Some people who listen to our podcast don't understand that the title of our podcast is a pun, but it is a pun. I'm curious to know a little bit more about some specific programs that engage LGBTQ plus folks uh, specifically. Yeah. So, you know, in addition to Stonewall, so we helped with the initial investment and I, I, you know, if if you've uh, geeked out on all the history there, you know that that was a little challenging because you couldn't buy the site outright. And so it was trying to do interpretation and then standing up a, a local 
friends group that took you know the theme study by the park service and then some additional work but some other things that are i think less obvious than stonewell are our investments in fire island national seashore whether it is natural resources or cultural resources there um, it's just the the history um, of the community there and then this park ventures program that i just talked about has been funding two things for a several years, queers in the wilderness, and then we have a service corps, and sometimes, well, we almost every year have, you know, different affinity groups or different identifying groups that want to have a core that is just about them as a safe space and a way for mentorship. And so through Service Corps, we've had the Rainbow Inclusion Cruise. It's not that it's a program, but we have programming in all of the different grants that we do with the Park Service that are focused on if somebody tells us they were excluded and they want to be included, how do we build that into the programming, whether it's service core, park ventures, storytelling, new park sites? Those are the most, in some ways, gratifying stories is to see a new story come to life that hadn't been told before. One of the other sites that really sticks in my mind in the last couple of years was the Sand Creek Massacre site in Colorado, which was where women and children were essentially slaughtered along the banks of the Sand Creek, and it is now a a national monument. To go through the Park Service process to get a new site started takes a lot of dedication and research and people dedicated to uncovering the story and raising it up. Um, And I think that's where we come in as we really help the Park Service with those needs. Because it's not that it's not important to them, it's very important to them, but sometimes what they can do can't happen fast enough. And so I really think of what we're able to do is that margin of excellence or pilots or proof of concept. It's things the Park Service wants to do, but the congressional process can take a long time to add things. Whereas they can come to us and say, we would really like to have different kinds of service core crews. What can you do? to help. We would like to have more inclusive storytelling. How could you help? Or we want to do a theme study. The director just uh, came to us and asked about a, a really specific theme study for Native American work. And so we were able to fund that right away. I'm so excited to hear about all the Park Ventures and the Service Corps programs being able to provide spaces for people who share points of identity. From time to time, we remind listeners of our show this, but the national parks and queer spaces have been, for years, intricately connected. We were on a a panel once with a, a park ranger, and the question was like, why should queer people care about national parks? And he was like, well, um, let's talk about all the queer spaces. Stonewall, Sandy Hook Beach, Fire Island, Provincetown, all of that is national park sites. And I was like, yeah, that's so true. I mean, there is like a, I feel like the National Park Service and the queer community have maybe unbeknownst to each other been like in partnership and collaboration for many, many years. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. I mean, I, I think about it as maybe queer communities were drawn to spaces because they were outdoors and were public spaces where they would feel safe and welcome together. So when you think of Fire Island in particular, you know, it was it, it, the gravity pulled people there. And I'm, I'm sure it's true of other spaces throughout the, the park system. And now it's just recognizing and making sure the history gets told. You know, there's also a LGBTQ history at Independence Hall that most people don't know that When we were there with the board to hear about the history of the signing of the declaration, the park ranger told us that story as well, which I don't think many people had heard. Um, And so, you know, I, I think it's important to make sure not just that we're protecting sites that people identify as being specific to the queer community, but also recognizing those stories are throughout the country. And how do you lift those up and how do you include those? Yeah, I believe were that was that the um the reminders, I think is what they were called. Like people would gather at Independence Hall. It was called like reminder days or something or something like that. Like, we read about that in the heritage theme study. Because those happened before the Stonewall riots happened and part of what what I feel like that 
that theme study lays out so beautifully is that queer liberation, queer history started long, long, long before Stonewall and that there were there are a lot of places all over this land also called America where we have had moments of queer history. Stonewall ended up being the thing that got a lot of media attention and it sparked so much and all those community groups were able to come together because of that. I'm curious too about I would love to know I mean you told us a little bit about your your background and you know your own history with the with the outdoors and um for so many of us who work in the outdoors or for so many of us who engage with the outdoors there's this sense of devotion there's this sense of it feels kind of like a calling it feels kind of like this is something I'm always going to be working to do. And I'm curious if there is a moment in your own timeline where you were like, I just feel like this is sort of working in this space is where I belong. Yeah, I don't know that I had any specific aha moment like that. It's been a series of happy accidents, but I think they weren't accidents. You know, for example, when I went to work in Kenya, I had gone to work on something completely different in the UN Environment Program and was a little surprised that I uh, wound up getting this research job. Um, And had you told me that I was going to be living in the bush for a year in a tent with just three other people. I might, I might not have taken the job, but you know, that, I, that was a, a pure happy accident. But I think that combined with going to camp, those were the times that I think when I think about it, I know I felt most happy when I had time outdoors. I felt most at peace. And I've always wanted everyone to experience that. It's such a gift that we have these public lands whether it is a local park or a national park, and that they really should be for everybody. I feel that strongly. And so, you know, I would say the last 15 years of my career have been, I have been on a mission to make sure as much as possible within my area of focus and ability that the outdoors is for all. If the idea of these public lands is that they are for everyone, they truly need to be for everyone. And what are all the different ways we can make that possible? I also want people to know, I mean, I I care deeply about the National Park Foundation, and and obviously I'm very committed to it, but I I don't want people to forget that there are, you know, 20,000 or more people working within the National Park Service who also deeply, deeply care about the national park system. They're willing to often work for less money than they could make in other fields. They often don't advance their own careers so they can stay within a park, you know, are so helpful and welcoming to people. Don't think of it as a federal agency and just people in the hat. They're humans and they have decided to take these jobs because they care deeply about the natural and cultural resources and the visitor experience. And they're truly amazing people. This has been Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast, and we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the national parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on this show, visit our website, gaze at the national parks.com. And that's gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram, on our website, and in the Gaze Shop is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written and performed by Dave Seaman and Mariella Klinger with Sean Sklios on guitar. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode that we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Ocean County, New Jersey.